Well, take the Word of God with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I believe we'll spend at least two weeks in this ninth chapter. We'll see how much we get covered tonight. I believe this is an extremely practical chapter, one that has been very helpful to me. One that I think is very important for a church to understand. This is a chapter of the Bible that, quite frankly, I never really heard a lot of teaching on growing up. And if I ever did, I never heard the whole thing. It was always one or two certain verses. And I, you'll, you'll reckon, recognize at least one of these verses. It's our text verse, the 13th verse is a, or excuse me, the 14th verse rather is a very well-known verse, but the context helps us understand it. So I want you to pay very close attention to the Word of God tonight and ask the Lord to help us because this is a very important chapter in the Bible. So if you found your place in 1 Corinthians 9, I'll ask you to stand with me if you're able, out of reverence to the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, and we'll begin reading in the first verse. Paul writes, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are ye not my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only am Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth not God take, excuse me, doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And that's our subject tonight. They that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So let's pray together. Father, help us to understand your word. As we've just read, these are things you've ordained. So as head of the church, you have right to ordain things in the church. So now we as your church desire to understand what you've ordained so we can obey it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, be seated, please. In the last chapter, Paul dealt with soul liberty and talked about things offered unto idols and such, and whether we eat or not eat in those things. And the last statement he made is wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Paul finishes the eighth chapter by saying, I willingly will lay aside my liberty out of love for the brethren. There are things I can do, but I choose not to, if it would be a help to my brethren. Now, he starts this chapter, first of all, number one, if you're taking notes, this will be a short message. There's seven points, but they'll be short, I promise. Sometimes in my sermon, it's kind of like a heavy set guy climbing over a barbed wire fence. A few points, and we'll be through it. That's supposed to be funny. But anyway, that joke used to be funny until I did that one day. I remember. You remember when I did that, honey? I was climbing over a fence. I had a brand new pair of Liberty overalls. You remember that? It was in Arizona. She, she says, which time? <laughs> I'm climbing over a fence and a piece of barbed wire caught my pant leg and just ripped an eight inch gash in those brand new Liberty overalls. And I nearly cried. I was so sad about that. But that has nothing to do with the message. I just thought that's a mental image you all need it to have. All right. So number one, there's a defense of his apostleship. 
He asked the question, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. There are some people who doubted that Paul was truly an apostle. And here's the reason. One, they didn't like him. He used to persecute the church. Furthermore, he was kind of a bulldog of a preacher. He was just kind of blunt and to the point. Some people didn't like that. In Acts chapter 1, we see the qualifications of an apostle. We've taught that here in the past, how when Judas was to be replaced, they gave some qualifications of an apostle. One of those is he had to have literally seen the Lord. And if you study Acts 1, you see those qualifications. And they chose Matthias to be the twelfth apostle in place of Judas. The problem is Paul was not chosen by the other apostles. Paul was chosen by Jesus Christ himself. Not as one of the twelve apostles representing the twelve tribes of Israel, but as an apostle to the Gentiles. It makes sense. If you have twelve apostles, twelve tribes of Israel, you need an odd man out to represent the Gentile people. And God chose Paul. So Paul asked the question, am I not an apostle? He goes on to say, am I not free? In other words, he says, am I not a Christian myself? Do I not have soul liberty? He just explained in Acts chapter, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 8, we spent two weeks looking at individual soul liberty. Paul saying, do I not have liberty? Am I not free? Yes, he is. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes, he had. He had been an eyewitness of a resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. And not, not to mention that he spent, I think it was three and a half years in Arabia learning from Jesus. One on one. Then he goes on to say, are not ye my work in the Lord? Furthermore, Paul's saying, have I not been the one that's ministered to you, the church at Corinth? Have I not been the one who helped you get saved, first of all, to lead you to Christ, organized the church, taught you the basics and got you going? Paul's the one that did this. He says, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. He says, even if other people don't accept me, you people have. I'm the one that's led you to Christ. He says, for the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. In other words, he says, the work God has done in Corinth is evident of my apostleship. If somebody claims to be an apostle but doesn't have a congregation, doesn't have any fruit, then it'd be easy to say they're not true. But Paul, speaking to the very people he led to Christ and organized into a church, he says, you people are the example of my apostleship. So Paul defends his apostleship, and he is an apostle. Number two, there's a defense of his soul liberty. My answer to them in verse three that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? He said, okay, whether or not they accept me as an apostle, here's my question. Do we not have power to eat and to drink. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? He says, do I not have the right to eat and to drink? Well, if you go all the way back, you don't have to turn there for time's sake, but Luke chapter 10, verse 7, Luke chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus told them uh, that well, if you go, if you if you look at this is when the Lord sent out His disciples, and He says in verse five, and into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house, and to whatsoever city you enter, if they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. So. The Lord sent his disciples city to city, house to house, said, you go there and if people will accept you, by all means, stop, spend time with that family, lead them to Christ. And if they feed you, accept it because you've earned it by ministering to them. So this meat and drink has to do with the work of the ministry. Paul's saying, do I not have the right to go about and to eat and to drink? And as I'm ministering to people, is it wrong that they're feeding me? This is one of the great debates in those early days as they were eating and drinking with Gentiles. Paul says, well, if I'm ministering to them, I'm going to have to eat with them. This is exactly what he's talking about. Some commentators I read argued this, but it makes total sense. Because in the 8th chapter, he's talking about eating meat offered unto idols. And he's saying, 
I won't eat meat at all if it causes my brother to offend. Now he's talking about if I'm ministering to people, leading them to Christ, and they feed me, Jesus said, whatever they lay before me, don't ask anything about it, just eat it. <laughs> Accept it as a gift because you're working, you're ministering to those people. Here we find, Paul says, do I not have power to eat and to drink? Furthermore, do I not have power to get married? Paul's already explained to them. We've covered it already. Was that back in the seventh chapter? Where Paul says, I think it's better if people stay single. You can do a lot more for God single. But here he says, do I not have the right to get married if I want to? He says, here he says, the other apostles have. He mentions Cephas, that's Peter. He mentions Cephas particularly. Peter had a mother-in-law, so Peter must have had a wife. He even mentions the brethren of the Lord. These are the half-siblings of Jesus. I know the Catholics will tell you that Jesus, that Mary never had any other children. But the Bible mentions them by name. They, he had brothers and sisters. And they got married, so Jesus had nieces and nephews. This is just common sense. And you say, and you say well, what if? Well, let's just pretend that Mary never did have any other children. Does that change anything? Not at all. It doesn't affect the gospel one bit. But yeah, it mentions them by name. So... I don't know why they can't accept it. But needless to say, Paul's saying, do I not have the individual soul liberty to go about preaching to people? And if they feed me, I eat. And if they give me something to drink, I drink it. And if God gives me a wife, do I not have the right to get married if I so choose? He says, or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. So number three, there's a defense of forbearing working. You realize... Paul worked his entire ministry. Quick little Bible study. Look at Acts 18.3. Acts 18.3, it says, uh, we see that Paul went to Athens. He found a Jew named Aquila and then his wife Priscilla. And it says, because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Paul uh, stayed in the home of Aquila and Priscilla. Why? They all did the same kind of work. And they did some work together, building tents for people. Furthermore, the 20th chapter, here's what Paul said in verse 34. Uh, this is Acts 20, 34. Paul says, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul said, if I needed money, I needed something, I went out with my hands and earned it. This is while he's preaching. As he had need, he went out and did some work to earn what he needed. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, here's what Paul says in the ninth verse. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we not, would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. He said, I worked day and night, and I didn't ask you people for anything. He said, I wasn't going to charge you. I was just working and providing my own need. I'll be honest, the more you study this book, the more you realize ministry has gotten away from this. There are a lot of preachers who, who will not work. They act like that they're entitled to be paid. And we're going to talk about in this verse, in this scripture, of how a pastor should be able to take some of the offering. But let's not forget the guy who's writing this, most of the time didn't take any money from the church and work with his own hands. There's an old joke of a preacher. They asked him how he knew he was called to preach. He said, I woke up on a Monday morning. I didn't want to go to work, and I was craving fried chicken. So I was new. I knew I was called to preach. He's trying to be funny, but that's actually pretty sad. A lot of people are in it for the income instead of the outcome. Not willing to work. The Bible says if a man won't work, he ought not to eat. Well, I would say if a preacher won't work, he ought not to preach. If he won't work. Some can't, I suppose. But if he won't work, terrible thing. I feel like I kind of have the right to preach a little hard on that because I've never worked harder in my life than I have the last three or four years. I feel like I work harder and have less than I've ever had. And that's just America. That's just life right now. We, everybody my age feels that. You're just working and you feel like you're not getting anywhere. And every, whether you're in ministry or not, that's just life, isn't it? And it's helped me because as I witness the people, they hear I'm a preacher, they think I'm a moocher, and then they find out I get up 4.30 in the morning, I go to work, I do those things. They're more willing to listen because they know I'm working. There's something important to be said about that. So Paul is saying here, 
do Barnabas and I have not we the power to just quit working if we felt like we should? He didn't do this, but he said I could. He said I shouldn't have to work, but I have. It's an interesting thing. Paul even received support from other churches. We'll find in the next, I'm not going to turn there for time's sake, but in 2 Corinthians, the second letter he writes to them in the 11th chapter, the 8th verse, Paul tells them, I've robbed other churches not to charge you. Paul acted like he was stealing from other churches to take their offerings when he didn't take money from the church at Corinth. He ends up almost regretting not taking anything from the church at Corinth. He words it as, I've robbed other churches to help you for free. That's, for, that's 2 Corinthians 11.8. Philippians 4, we understand Paul received support from the church of Philippi. The church of Philippi, he told them, he said, I have received once and again your care to my necessity from Epaphroditus. He said, now in the beginning of the gospel, no other church communicated with me such as giving and receiving as ye only. The church in Philippi sent money to help Paul. And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with churches helping other churches. Nothing wrong with that. The problem is when one church feels entitled to receive help. You realize, and it happens all the time, I get more calls from people wanting money from this church than I've ever had in ministry. Almost every day, I get an email, a phone call, something, somebody wanting money. People in the community, other churches, missionaries, and those things. And you can't always do it. You just can't. But there's nothing wrong with helping. Nothing wrong with giving as you have. And I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But Paul is saying, I have the right not to work a job. Now he describes why. And going on. There's some principles. Number four, there's some principles we must understand. Look at verse seven. Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charges? I mean, how, how much sense would that make? I know, uh, I know some of you have served in the military. What if you went to join up and they said, all right, you're going to join the military. You're going to fight for your country. You need to donate $800 a month to the army. You've got to buy your own boots, buy your own uniform, buy your own ammunition. That, that wouldn't make any sense. You're going to serve so the country provides the means for you to serve. This is just a philosophy that we see in the military. Who goeth the warfare at his own charges? Or who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? How many of you have planted a garden this year of any kind? Anybody plant anything? Tomatoes? Anything? Nobody? Really? Did you? Anybody? They did? Okay. This is the first year we haven't in a while. I told her next year we're going to plant some tomatoes. She did plant, she planted some blueberries and blackberries back here to grow along the fence in the back. And, but it, they just got planted. It'll be a while before. But I guarantee you something. We planted blueberries and blackberries back here. And I guarantee you when they start producing fruit, we're going to partake. Right? If you plant a vineyard, you're going to eat some grapes, aren't you? It just makes sense. You do the work, you're going to enjoy it. Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Would it make any sense to have a milk goat and not drink any milk? No, you're going to drink it or you're going to bottle it and sell it and keep the money and you're not going to give that money back to the goat. You might feed the goat. You might put money into the goat, but you're going to enjoy the fruits of your labor, right? This, has happened, this happens in everything of life. Paul says, saith I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? So there's principles we understand, but then number five, the law of God says this. I love this scripture, Deuteronomy, and I'll show you why I love it. I've, if, you guys might actually laugh at this. This might be one funny thing I say that y'all laugh at, because I, I chuckle about it every time I read this. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, it says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. Paul quotes that when he says, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. In other words, you have an ox, and this ox is hooked up to a, um, a corn uh, mill. And he's got this yoke about him, and he's turning this, this mill in circles, and those rocks are grinding the corn, and they're turning it into grain. Well... God told Israel, if you have an ox that's walking in circles and laboring to tread your corn, you're not allowed to put a muzzle on him that prevents him from reaching down and eating some of the corn that he's working. That if the ox is walking in circles working, he has earned the right to eat a little bit, not talking about eating all of it, eating a little bit of the work. 
And the question is, does not God care for the oxen? And here's what's funny. God's comparing the preacher here to a dumb old ox. You're, you're yoked up, you're tied up, you're walking in circles, doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. That's all a preacher does. We read a book that you have at home with authority telling you what you already know over and over and over again. If you think about it, it's a little bit depressing. If you think about, if, as a pastor, I try not to think about that, that a pastor's job is no different than an ox. Does the same thing over and over and over and over again. And the Bible principle here is, if the ox is working, he's allowed to take some of it. Does not God care for the oxen? Furthermore, is the apostle, is the preacher of the gospel any different than the ox? He says, or saith he it altogether for our sakes. Paul is saying, God put that little thing in there about the ox, not just to take care of the oxen, but he did that for us too. He says, for our sakes, no doubt this is written. That he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partakers of his hope. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to work. And I'm going to work every day this week. And I'm hoping to get paid next Thursday. I expect that because I'm going to work. You work, you expect to get paid, right? Paul says, I am plowing in hope as an ox plows and works in hope. He should be a partaker of the hope. So the law of God even requires that if somebody is working, the labor is worthy of their hire. I don't think I wrote that verse down, but that's a quote that's in the scripture. The laborer is worthy of his hire. That was, I believe the Lord said that in that scripture we read a bit ago, where he said that they put food before you eat it because the laborer is worthy of his hire. You go and minister to people, accept it. As a preacher, I've gone to people's homes and had Bible studies and ate with them and, and ministered to people. And I remember, uh, well, it wasn't very long ago. We were somewhere. I don't remember where it was. It all runs together anymore. But I, I was preaching somewhere, and a little girl walked up and handed me like 35 cents. Remember that? 35 cents. That's just such, I still have it. I haven't used it. I just still have it. And it reminds me how God will give us even the little things we need. I've also... I had $10,000 checks placed in my hand. What's more important? They're, they're equal in the eyes of God. God. God blesses His servant. He provides the needs of His servant. And one is not greater than the other. In fact, the man who wrote me the $10,000 check, he might himself say that little girl with the 35 cent offering. And may even be more precious. Because it came from a sincerity of a youth. You see, the law of God requires they that preach should live of it. Furthermore, there's more scriptures. Number six, there are further scriptures and principles. Look at verse 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So Paul says, if I'm ministering about spiritual things, is it really some great thing if we take some carnal things? When we say carnal, we're talking about fleshly things, the things of this life. You know, uh, the preacher doesn't get paid by, earthly, by heavenly blessings from the church. He gets earthly blessings from the church. You guys have heard the story of the old cowboy circuit riding preacher. He rode in the town on a beautiful black horse. Beautiful horse. The preacher's suit is threading apart and frayed and, and coming apart. But man, the, the horse, the, his coat was shiny as a beautiful horse. One of the ladies in the church said, Preacher, how come your horse looks so good and you look so poor? He said, well, because I feed my horse, but the church feeds me. <laughs> it's a funny joke, but it does prove the point. It does prove the point. He says, if we've sown you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? And then he says, if others be partaker of this power over you, are not we rather? Did you know each and every one of you have, have bill collectors that you have to pay? Your power bill, your water bill, your gas bill, your internet, your phone bill. Whatever you have, there are many, many things in your life that have power over you. A power to take from your pocketbook. That's life. There is always somebody reaching into your pocketbook and you're getting something in return. It's power, it's water, it's gas, it's food, it's something. You're getting something. I know it doesn't go as far as it used to go, but it goes somewhere. And it goes very quickly, doesn't it? Somebody said my, my fuel bill now looks like my grocery bill. My grocery bill looked like my Costco bill. My Costco bill looks like my mortgage. And that, that's the truth of inflation of where we are, but that's the truth. 
people have power over your money. And Paul says, is it wrong that we do it too? But then he says something interesting. He says, nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Writing to the church of Corinth, Paul says, I have a right to take of the offerings of the church, and I've chosen personally not to do it. Because I do not want to hinder the gospel of Christ. It's interesting that the examples we see in Scripture, there's more than one of Paul not taking. And it was his own choice. He's implying to the church that he's entitled to take it, and he chooses not to. It's interesting. He says in verse 13 now, and here's our last, uh, our last point of this. The Lord hath ordained this principle. Look, at we see, look what we see. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? We would agree that in the Old Testament system, it was holy, how men would take the best of their, of their lambs, the best of their goats, the best of their flocks, and they would offer it to God, Right? These were, this was an offering to God. But in this offering to God, these men whom God hath ordained as priests would partake in the offering to God. If you read Leviticus 6, we won't, won't read the whole thing. But listen to some of this out of Leviticus chapter 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering. Speak unto... Whoop, I went too far. Because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire had consumed with the burnt offering, and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments, and put on other garments, and carry forth the ashes without the camp into a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, and it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and he shall burn the, thereon the fat of the peace offering. So we're reading the priest worked very hard, isn't he? Working very hard, cleaning up the ashes, putting on his work clothes and doing these things. Verse 14, this is the law of the meat offering. The son of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord, before the altar. And he shall take of it his handful of the flour of the meat offering and of the oil thereof and all the frankincense which is upon the meat offering and shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor, even the memorial of it unto the Lord. So who, where is this offering going? It's going to God and the remainder thereof. So after it has gone to God, there's some left. And the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat. And the unleavened bread shall be eaten in the holy place. And in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation shall they eat it. And we're not going to read all of Leviticus 6, but you're reading the law of God and you know what you'll find? That the priests, when they would offer to God, they would eat some of it. They would eat some of it. Why? Because they're working. They're working for God. The priests did not work for Israel. They worked for God. Here's the greatest damage I believe that's happened in American churches. Not just American, worldwide, but in modern day churches. Pastors have become employees of the church. The average church has a set salary for the pastor. They have rules he has to follow, and they have all these boundaries, all these things, and the preacher is treated like a hireling. Paul said, I would rather not get paid at all than to hinder the gospel of being a hireling. Paul is saying, what the Lord hath ordained is, just like they that ministered of the things of the temple partook of the things of the temple, that the Levites took some of the offering, and so should the preacher. This is in the Old Testament system. This is how God orchestrated it way back in Moses' day that the priests would take some of it. They would live of the holy things of the temple. Again, I, I know a lot of guys have tried to solve this issue of how should the pastor be paid. And some, I even have friends that do this, and I'm not against them, but I do believe this is not the best way. We have an offering box in the back. They have one that says church, one that says pastor. And you, the people, as you're tithing, choose, do you give it to the church or give it to the pastor? And that puts responsibility on you to make a choice that's really not fair. The biblical model I see is you just give it to the Lord by giving it to the church. And after the church bills are paid, after God's work has been done, and anything that's needed for the work of the Lord has been taken care of first, the preacher takes some of it. 
the percentage makes sense according to the temple. And it works in the church age as well because Matthew 10.10, 10, it says this. Matthew 10.10, 10, Jesus is giving His instructions. Oh, this is the scripture I mentioned earlier. He has given them instructions about going out and He says, Take nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. In other words, he said, you go out and do my work, and I'll make sure you have something to eat. I'll provide your needs. Here's what happened in the church. Just like they that ministered of the things of the temple, which weighed at the altar, are partakers of the altar. Notice this. Not everything that was given to the, to the temple went to the priest, but the priest took some of it. There's the emphasis, some of it. How much did they take? Well, it depended on how much came in. There's really no set amount. However much came in, they took of some. And if nothing came in, they didn't eat. But guess what? Something always came in. It says in verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. I've heard that verse quoted my whole life, and here's exactly what the verse is saying. Just like the priest would take some of the offering, God has ordained that the, the New Testament gospel preachers would take a little bit too. That's just how, that makes perfect sense and lines up in the scripture. Now here's the conclusion of it. Paul says this, but I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things that it should be done so unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For I do this thing willingly. If I have a, and I have a reward, but if against my will dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. In other words, here's what Paul's saying. He said, I haven't done this. I haven't always taken some of the offering because I preach the gospel whether I'm paid or not. For woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Necessity is laid upon me. I must preach the gospel. Paul says, I'm not writing this to you because I feel like I deserve it. I'm writing this to you for you to understand this is how God intended the church to function. So why am I preaching this? Well, because we're going verse by verse through Corinthians and here we are. This is not my way of saying that I need a raise. This is my way of explaining to you, here's where we get our principle. Our, our church already has this understanding that every month that goes by, after the bills are paid and after everything's covered, whatever's left in the church bag, I will take some of it. Now, how much do I take? Often I don't take anything because the, not enough's there. A good shepherd, a good pastor is going to put the needs of the church first and the work of the ministry first. And if there's nothing to take, there's nothing to take. Just like Paul, I can say, I have worked with my hands, laboring for the needs of my necessities and my families. But I intend to keep working and doing that until I no longer have to. Or as I heard one preacher say, you work as a pastor as long as you can. When you get to the point that the church has grown and there's more work than you can handle, then you stop working a physical uh, uh, civilian job. I can think of the right word. Civilian's not the right word, but a secular job. And just focus on the church. I, I pray the day comes that I will just completely live of what comes into the Lord's offering box. We're just not there yet. But here's what I do. I, I have zero guilt at all of living of the gospel. I am doing that here already. We live in the church meeting house. We live here. Why do we live here? This is the Lord's house. My kids know that. You ask my kids, hey Leland, where is he? Is he in here? He's in the other room? He's laying down. If I ask Leland, whose house is this? You know what he always says? It's Jesus. The other day there was trash in the yard. He'll say, Dad, somebody threw trash in Jesus' yard. They know whose house this is. They know it's not ours. But just like the priests lived of the things of the temple, we live of the things in the church. The Lord had provided a van. Somebody gave a van to the work of the Lord here. Now, for paperwork, we put it in my name just because you can't put the title of a vehicle in the name of Jesus Christ, unfortunately. But I'm a steward of the church. I, I am responsible for the church. I know that's not my van. But I, I am a caretaker of it. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And I use that van to pick up people for church, to use it for the work of the Lord, but I also drive it to take my family to the grocery store and to do those things. Why? 
They that preach the gospel live of the gospel. If the church here has a need, I'm going to work with my hands to try to help meet it. And when the church doesn't have a need and we have abundance, I'll take a little myself. And it's the principle that we see. Now, now here's the big question. What if a preacher abuses this and he takes too much? Then God kills him and you get a new preacher. I believe that. I believe that wholeheartedly. That God will not be robbed. And the Lord will handle such things. Now, we practice this. This is true. I don't mind working. I say I don't. I pray the day comes where I won't have to work. I've told my boss this. I said, I'm going to work as much as I have to right now. My goal is, as soon as possible, I'll go to part-time and less and less and less and fades out as the Lord grows the church, as He grows it. And when those days come, I will have zero guilt taking more out of the church and having to work less. But until that day comes, like Paul, I'll say, I have worked with my hands to meet the needs of my family. And when I can, I do take of the things of the church. But I want the church to understand, this is not some crazy idea that Bobby Johnston came up with. It's all right here in the Word of God. It's exactly how the Lord ordained the church to operate. The day that preached the gospel should live of the gospel. And it's a wonderful thing. I'm grateful the Word of God has this in here this way. So just remember, your pastor's an ox. He's an ox. I'm just working, we're going in circles, doing the same thing over and over again. From time to time, I'll take a mouthful out of the corn that's on the ground. But only if I'm working. Only if I'm laboring. That's the key. The work. Uh, last verse I'll read, and this is the conclusion. Oh, I did not write it down. I did not write down the reference, but it's in Timothy, I believe, that the Bible talks about they that labor in the Word are worthy of double honor. That those that are working are to be compensated, but only those that are working. I believe it wholeheartedly. If a man doesn't work, he ought not to eat. He ought to work. We all have work to do. But the Lord has ordained that they that preach the gospel shall live of the gospel. And what a wonderful thing that is. Next week, Lord willing, we'll continue with this thought. Where we'll pick back up where Paul says, necessity is laid upon me if I preach not the gospel. Let's stand for prayer and we'll close tonight. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for these truths of the Scripture. Help us to learn from them and understand them and be obedient to them. Father, we're grateful. You have provided every need of this church. We have no debt. We have a van we can use for your glory of picking up people. The bills are paid. We owe no man anything, and we give you glory for that. And we ask that you would continue to meet the needs. As this building has needs of repair, we trust the Lord to prepare, repair them because it's his house. As your servants have need, we trust you to give us the strength to work or the means to provide the needs. In all these things, we simply desire to be your servants and to trust you for our provision. But help us all to be obedient and good stewards of what you've entrusted to us. You've entrusted this church with many things, and we need to be good stewards of them. And it is required in a steward that he be found faithful. So help me as a steward of this congregation to be a faithful steward. And woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Help me to be a faithful steward. Help all of us to be faithful stewards. Dismiss us with your blessing. Give us safety on the road. Bring us back at the next appointed time. For we ask these things in Jesus' name.